Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Lipsack, for taking the time to, to talk to me. Um, do you mind just uh, giving like a brief introduction about yourself and telling us a little bit about your practice? Well, I'm an eye surgeon. Uh, I've been in practice uh, for decades. Uh, and uh, I have a general ophthalmology practice uh, with a lot of cataract surgery and a subspecialty in LASIK surgery. Uh, and uh, so we see a lot of patients um, in the LASIK category, like between, let's say, on the average, between 20 and 45 or 20 and 50. Um, and then in the cataract age and macular degeneration age, and um, we see a lot of people who are between 70 and 90. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, the practice that we have. Sounds great. Um, and so how did you hear about upper room germicidal UV light? Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm in a, something called a refractive surgery alliance uh, for um, serious uh, LASIK surgeons. Uh, and I had heard about it early on. You know, we had closed for three months, but so it was like early, I think, April or so, or mid-April, um, that uh, another ophthalmologist uh, in Louisiana had said he, um, a neighbor or, or a friend of theirs was uh, in the HVAC uh, field uh, and, uh, uh, and had mentioned that we should take a look at uh, the ASHRAE site, um, and, uh, which is the Association of HVAC uh, Professionals. And um, in one way or the other, I, 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 I looked at that site and they had uh, really good information uh, on, um, you know, for during COVID, uh, what could be done with uh, filtration and ventilation and then various technologies um, I learned about, uh, which was UVC as well as uh, photocatalytic uh, oxidation, PCO, and electronic ionization. So I did a deep dive into that. Yeah. And, and, then, um, and then it was uh, organized, uh, um, uh, that, uh, the doctor in Louisiana actually organized, um, uh, uh, through doing the same kind of deep dive into this, he found out about um, uh, ASHRAE and got uh, Bill Banflett, who's one of the, country's leading uh, experts on uh, UVC, and uh, he's a, a PhD engineer, knows a lot about HVAC filtration and ventilation, and especially UV. Uh, he's a professor at Penn State. Uh, and so uh, him and another uh, a person who had a master's uh, in engineering, another expert in that field, uh, gave a talk to some of us, uh, a little Zoom call. Um, nice. And that got me further interested. Uh, yeah. And so then I followed up with uh, Bill um, uh, and you know, asked a lot of questions. Uh, and, um, and, and then the, um, the difficulty was finding someone uh, who knew something about this. Uh, in, it tends to be people in the HVAC field uh, who know about it. Um, and so that would be the next step. How did I actually implement it? Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. And then, so you had all these conversations with professionals and um, sounds like other physicians as well. So how did you become convinced that it was the right thing for your office? Was there any particular piece of information or any data that you found particularly convincing? Well, uh, it, it was really uh, the information they had at the ASHRAE side. It also uh, read information from the, uh, I think the call the, uh, uh, the Illumination Engineering Society. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some articles there as well, and mm -hmm. I read others, uh, 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 other areas. Uh, and um, I like that article, the long um, uh, white paper in uh, at the ASHRAE site uh, that put up where I learned about the upper air UV um, relative to some other technologies. So what I learned was that you could have, uh, that I learned that, first of all, I learned that ventilation was really important. I had no clue to begin right. with. Uh, and then also about the different filtrations um, uh, that were available. Um, 
different MERV systems, HEPA filters, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then UV or other uh, kind of technologies that were used within the, the ducts. Um, and uh, I, I was a little concerned about PCO, photocatalytic oxidation, because it, uh, based on what I was reading, that it's possible uh, uh, to have the production of ozone, and some will say they don't produce any ozone, and then, but also that you could have some other by, unwanted byproducts that you might not know about, depending on what's in your environment, such as formaldehyde. And right. I said, why would I want to even, you know, risk that? Right. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, um, electronic ionization. Um, and, uh, and they were within a duct so that the uh, air might be, and you could also put UV lights in, in series in the duct to clean the air right. coming out the way, uh, if you have enough in there, if you can get in there. Uh, and then, of course, you can put U, uh, UVC over the coils, but that's not really sterilizing the air. That's uh, elongating the life of the system uh, and, uh, you know, keeping it clean from fungus and that kind of thing. Right. That wouldn't be protecting us against uh, COVID unless you had a bunch of them in series or use those other technologies. But then, let's say you're doing something within the ducts um, to sterilize the air, uh, and then uh, including filtration, good filtration. Uh, but then the air coming out is sterile, but then you're, we're in one of these small little exam rooms. And remember, I got a lot of patients who are 86 years old, right. uh, and I really needed to protect them. I'm not a spring chicken, and here I was going to go back to work. And right. I had a, and I'm in that risk group, but not like an 86 year old. Right. Uh, sure. and, uh, so we just wanted to make sure everything was as safe as possible. And so we're in these little exam rooms and you're putting your chin in the, what we call the suit lab <laughs> exam and you're close to people. Mm -hmm. uh, so how could we keep them safe besides the plastic barriers that we uh, added to any of the testing machines we have here? Um, and so the air, if you're using the induct systems coming out is clean, but then if somebody's COVID positive and you're in the small eight by 10 exam right. room, testing room, and then so, then it gets contaminated. Yeah. So upper air UV was uh, made much more sense to me because that was more like the bottom line. Right. Uh, yeah. In the air that you're breathing in that room while you're there. Uh, and, um, and it seems very safe. Uh, right. Fortunately, we have 10 foot ceilings and nine foot ceilings here. It has to be up as high as eight feet. So we were good okay. for that. Uh, That's perfect. And, uh, and so that was the, the thought process that went through it. Yeah. How long did the installation process take for, because I mean, you have, you have lots of rooms, you have the waiting room. Um, was it a couple of weeks? Well, let me just start with the, the fact that it took me three months to get this done because nobody in Virginia knew anything about it. Good so point, for yeah. example, so, for, so that's a big problem when it comes to upper air UV is the lack of knowledge by people in the profession, uh, let alone others. Uh, and so, for example, I, there's a, a, one of the largest HVAC companies, very respectable in this area, uh, that was even advertising about UV now with COVID. Uh, so I called them in and, and I said, I want, um, you know, I'd like to have some upper air UV. And, and he said, you, you, but then you can't do that because people have to leave the room. Uh, you know, yeah, we can put it in, but they have to, you can't be in there when you do it. I said, no, no, no. Upper air UV is not the same as surface UV lights, right. which we also looked into. Yeah. By the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, we decided in the end to use 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol for cleaning down things. Um, but uh, so, so he didn't really understand. Um, and so anyway, he wrote me up. I said, he said, okay, well, I'll write you up a proposal. There's a UV guru, I know that's in, uh, I think it's in New Jersey, uh, and it was very difficult getting a hold of that person, but finally he, uh, he worked up something for me, and it's a good thing I had a little bit of knowledge, because I noticed right. that, all right, here's your upper air UV, and he wrote up something for, uh, for photocatalytic oxidation, <laughs> so just to give you an idea, and, um, and it was like really expensive, uh, and uh, so, um, but the person I eventually got through to, it was very difficult because they were traveling around. There's very few experts in this field. These are people who've been for decades uh, putting in upper air UV in TB clinics throughout the world. Just in the United yeah. States, we don't have TB clinics, so right. they don't know about it. Right. Um, and so, um, so I was trying to you know, work 
something with that, but it's hard to get a hold of him. And I, I gave a call to Bill Bamflin, who gave me a few names, but I landed on someone in New York, uh, Bill Palmer, um, who owns a factory uh, and you know also very you know very knowledgeable right. about this. Uh, but so, but the process, and, and again, you know, the electrician, so uh, didn't know anything about it. We had to set it up. So what? So the process with the with the level that people know now, uh, the the present knowledge out there, which you're trying to get people to understand more about, uh, is so low that uh, I had to work with the manufacturer. Uh, so I right. was uh, measuring. Uh, room dimensions. I was taking photographs of every room because if there's reflective um, objects in the room, that would affect, because it has to be precisely um, set up with right. the, uh, the uh, right amount of UV. It depends, it determines uh, the size of the room and uh, determines the size of the UV fixtures and the number of UV fixtures. And so I would send him, we measured every room and took photographs from all different kinds of angles and would send it there, and then he was calculating per cubic inch of each room uh, what we needed. And then so then he would, uh, then we, we located an electrician who was very easy to work with, but didn't know anything about this, but, uh, but, uh, but Bill told him exactly what we would be putting, uh, what we would be uh, using and exactly in each room where it would go, long right. distance. Uh, and so the electric, uh, so, so once we went through all that practice, took three from start, let's say in mid-April, learning about it, or early April, we were, it took about three months to get them actually in. So uh, they would ship, they ship them down um, from New York, the, the, the uh, fixtures. Um, and once, uh, you know, that was fast, just easy to ship them down. Uh, and once they were here, from start to finish, uh, took three days, uh, which uh, included um, the electricians hooking everything up and Bill himself driving down and what they call, quote unquote, commissioning them. Right. Which, uh, so they need to be metered properly. Uh, and, um, and, and Bill spent the day here educating um, my staff and... Um, we had already been talking with electricians uh, and uh, commissioning everything. Uh, and so about three days. So, uh, uh, so it took a long time because nobody else knew anything about it. Right. Uh, but I think if more people knew about it and, and it was set up in their areas. It's really simple. I mean, you know, two or three days. You know, yeah, something like that. that's what it sounds like. That's... Yeah, and we have many rooms, you know. Right, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have... Uh, the whole, I can't remember the total number of lights that we use, but over 20 lights for sure. Right. And, um, we have many uh, like eight by 10 or nine by nine exam rooms and testing rooms, as well as an operating room and waiting right. room and, and that kind of thing. Right. And so I guess kind of along those lines too, if you feel comfortable sharing, how much did it, did it cost you? Well, um, it cost a total of uh, right around $30,000. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I feel like we've had a, a couple people mention something around that number. Um, of course, a so lot depends on how many rooms you're doing and what, you know, how many lights and the size right. of the light, that kind of right. thing. Right. Yeah. So how, how have your patients reacted? Are they, are they worried or do they kind of get a peace of mind? Um, I, I, well, of first, you know, if, uh, I think UV lights are great. I think it's great technology. Um, and it can be used in many different venues, certainly in schools. Uh, and, you know, traditionally it's been in TV clinics, but you right. know, why not in schools? Why not? You know, we have different, many layers of, of, of safety here. One of them is the UV lights. We're doing other things as well. But um, so UV lights uh, in schools, in retail, uh, or what have you, right? So let's say if it's in retail, it's good for business. People will know right. they're more secure. Right. So you ask me what, how do patients react? They love it. We have it boldly listed on uh, our website about what we're doing, all the different steps, and UV is one of them. And I oh, said, awesome. for those who want to learn more about UV, we give a link to the ASHRAE article. 
somebody really wants to do a deep dive into it. Right. Um, uh, but I, you know, feel that we needed to keep our patients uh, safe. Right. And uh, the patients have reacted really positively. They're right. Really, so no one's, no one's skeptical or anything. They, well, no, they walk in here. They say, wow, I, I've, I haven't, I've been to a lot of, you know, a lot of these people like 85 years old or 80 <laughs> years old or 70. I've been to a lot of doctors. Nobody's doing what you're doing because we're right. doing multiple things. Uh, but, um, and they, they love the, I, a lot of times it, well, some have already read it on the website or they know they have sort of, they see it, but they don't exactly know what it is. And it's, a uh, it's a nice uh, thing to, to talk about, you know, topic yeah. of conversation with the patient yeah. point out the UV and they love the fact that we have it. So it's a definitely positive thing. Right. Uh, I would think that, um, businesses would use it more to help uh, their staff feel more safe. Uh, certainly schools, that's a hot topic uh, now, is reopening schools. Wow, that would be great there to make the teachers feel safer. Uh, and then uh, businesses, I think it would be good for business. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so have you had any cases traced back to your office at all, if you feel comfortable sharing? I, I'm uh, no, kind of doubting zero. it. No, no I don't think. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of what I assumed, especially because so, yeah. And so I'm an example of somebody who's a senior citizen, and I'm not hiding away in my house. I know a lot of people, you know, because we're at higher risk. They say you got to be careful. So I, it's an example of somebody being very active in the public, seeing 40 people a day, getting close right. to them with barrier, but with the proper precautions. Exactly, uh, and um, and just trying to be as safe as I can. Uh, and so I, I, I think this is uh, an approach. And I think UVC, upper air UVC, is something that helps along the, the, those lines. Right, kind of using what you've done as a model for, for other spaces, other offices and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I know you've touched on it a little bit, but um, what are some of the other like layers that you've implemented? So you have those face shields. Um, are you encouraging people to wash their hands? Have you modified like the waiting room? Um, Yes, uh, we have, uh, well, we screen everybody for uh, any kind of COVID-related symptoms and take the temperature before they enter. Uh, we don't trust their masks, so we give them a medical grade mask when they enter. Oh. Um, and um, the, I wear a surgical uh, N95 3M made in America kind of mask uh, mm -hmm. and then a medical grade mask over that. And even still, it fogs up our ocular devices that we examine. So I, I have to tape the top. So it just goes to show that N95s aren't 100%. Um, and, right. and, uh, but, you know, we have multiple layers. So uh, we, we're giving patients masks. Um, we the cleaning. We have alcohol stations all over the place. Uh, and we're constantly cleaning with the isopropyl alcohol um, um, or actually with Purellus ethyl alcohol. Um, and we're, we're cleaning down with the isopropyl alcohol on the uh, on surfaces constantly. So, uh, for example, when a patient's coming in and being uh, going into a testing room, and then they need to go into the exam room, they make them wait out of outside the door of the testing room and say, "Wait here, please, because I'm going to clean the room." So we don't leave a, a room until it's cleaned uh, thoroughly with the isopropyl alcohol mm -hmm. wipe down on everything uh, before we um, uh, leave. And then we have signs that says, "Room ready, room not ready." Uh, and um, we try to keep as much social distancing as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. As for the staff, we close down the kitchen, uh, and um, and we're very careful uh, to that people are wearing masks and that they're not getting close. So we used to have um, two uh, receptionists uh, with check in and a check out. Mm -hmm. Now, we, but they were kind of close together. So now we just have one person doing the check in and check out themselves. Patients call as, you know, which happens a lot of places. Uh, they, they're in the car in the parking lot. Uh, and um, uh, when they're here, we, uh, the other receptionist that used to be in the check in in the check out window is now, um, uh, the patients know to call us in advance. Um, we're always checking in the parking lot if somebody's come. Um, but anyway, they talk on the phone uh, and she screens them uh, in their car and then, um, we let them come in. Now we have way fewer uh, chairs uh, in the waiting room. They're sort of turning our, a lot of them around backwards so nobody can sit in them. Uh, and we had to decrease 
somewhat uh, the number of patients we're seeing to be able to do it this way. Uh, and um, uh, we changed out uh, all the sinks, the multiple sinks here, both in bathrooms and for cleaning our hands uh, um, uh, at the various stations. Uh, and so we have, we turned it all into automatic, no touch sinks, automatic oh, nice. paper towel dispensers and automatic soap dispensers. So that took uh, a little time to do as well. Uh, right. So those are the kind of steps that we've taken. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds very thorough, um, which is really great. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. I'm, I've gone through all the questions we have. Is there anything else you'd like to, to mention about URG, UV, or advocate um, for? Uh, I, I could give you a tour as, as so you get to see what, uh, what some of the UV lights look like. Sure. Yeah, yeah. If you want to, if you want to take us and show us a few, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I'm going to switch uh, this right. around. Hold on. There we go. So uh, this happens to be a laser right here, but there's the UV right in this room. And so yeah, I'll, I'll take you here. So when the patients enter, notice they have the the. Uh, Purell station here and the thermometer right there and the mask oh, wow. that we put on them. Uh, but they enter here and there's the, the check in and check out window now. Um, oh, and so this is the waiting room and there's a UV. So this is a large waiting room with, so we needed that size UV in two of them. Uh, there and one there. Mm -hmm. um, and you see it's, uh, it's kind of nice looking actually. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not too certain, bad. It has a certain aesthetic to it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then we come back here. Now this is the clinic area and to the right is our operating room where we do LASIK surgery. So I'll turn the light on. And by the way, when the lights are off, you can see you know, a little glow. But um, so we got one there and one up here. And this is all calculated by, the, by Bill uh, Palmer uh, prior to getting here. But, and then uh, everything worked good. He had to adjust the, the louver kind of slots on it uh, to get, when he commissioned it, to get it perfect, right, the way he wanted. So mm -hmm. it's safe and effective. Um, and so the patients come in and, and you can see they're in all these little testing rooms here, there's a little light up here. Um, and you see in a, here, the light's off, so you see that gives that glow. UV light is invisible, but this is, uh, the bulbs are coated with something so you can actually see light coming out, but that's visible light. Um, so you know they're on when, when that visible right. light and we leave there. it on 24 hours. It's, it's, it costs just about nothing in terms of electricity. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Um, and uh, so here's like a typical exam room, right? So it's small. We close the door for privacy. So you're in here. We don't, we used to allow family members in, but not anymore unless they have to be in here. Um, uh, because for various reasons, the, the patient needs uh, help. Uh, and so it's a small room, and so and just need a small one, just one of them. Right. You can see that there. Uh, and, um, uh, and it works good. I feel, and the patients feel very safe. Uh, and, and so you see how many different rooms we have. See, here's a tech station, and there's one up there. But all down this hall is many different testing and laser rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all throughout the place. Right. Um, here's another one. Um, you know, patient scheduling rooms, uh, and and there you go. Wow. So That's I'm going to turn turn this on around again. Cool. There we go. All right. All right Thanks good. so much, Doctor. Looks like That's so great to to see all that in action. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Um, yeah. Any any. Anything else you want to add? No, anything else you'd like to ask me? I think that's it. So yeah, I, I, I will just add it. I, I think it's great that you all are doing this. Well, thanks so much. I, yeah. it's such a lack of knowledge in, yeah, in, in as you're saying, UV, you know, yeah. and so I, I mean, I really got to hand it to you. I, I mean, I, um, I'm not sure exactly how you're going to educate the public, but, um, I'm here to help, uh, and uh, well, I think and, your your testimony will be will be super helpful. So, and we're gonna you know put it on our website and everything. So, um, and it should be pretty freely accessible. We'll probably probably use YouTube or something to 
to spread the word. So. Wow. Awesome. Just keep me posted. Yeah, for sure. We'll be in touch. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. So much. Have a good one.